Hello and welcome to Our American States, a podcast from the National Conference of State Legislatures. I'm your host, Ed Smith. We really saw there was this emergence of exciting and innovative new models to pay for education and training. That was Ethan Pollack, a senior director at Jobs for the Future, a national nonprofit aimed at expanding economic opportunity. He's my guest on the podcast, along with Andrew Smalley, an education policy expert at NCSL. Paying for college and other post-secondary education continues to be a challenge for many. Already, 44 million Americans owe more than $1.7 trillion, yes, trillion with a T, in student loan balances. At the same time, there's a strong connection between lifetime earnings and post-secondary education. Ethan discussed a number of innovative financing strategies involving philanthropic organizations, employers, government, and financial institutions that offer the promise of helping students pay for their education at a lower cost, and in some instances, that better scale the cost to the potential earnings of the graduate. Andrew explained the steps states are taking to help facilitate these innovative approaches and also broke down what most students and families pay for post-secondary education. Here's our discussion, starting with Andrew. Andrew, nice to have you on the podcast again. Yeah, great to be back, Ed. So, uh, Andrew, the cost of college and post-secondary education, the affordability of it, is a topic we've discussed before on this podcast, and, and I suspect it's one we'll, we'll probably discuss again. It's a kind of a, a perennial issue. Uh, I wonder if you could just start by giving the listeners a, a broad overview of what it costs to go to college or post-secondary education these days and, and how that situation has changed over time. Sure. You know, it's definitely a topic that generates a lot of media coverage. As you mentioned, we've talked about it on this show before. If you're a parent or a grandparent with a student thinking about enrolling in college, you probably see tuition prices that are significantly higher than what you paid when you went to school, even if it wasn't that long ago. Tuition has grown about four to five times the cost of inflation over the past few decades. Private schools routinely average over $40,000 a year for tuition. And some four-year universities are approaching $20,000 a year in tuition costs. But two sort of key things to think about around the cost conversation is that first, institution type matters a lot. Many in-state public schools are much more affordable. And the second piece of it is that the top line numbers generally reflect sticker prices that don't factor in financial aid and the significant discounting that many low and middle income students can receive. If you look at the net cost of attendance, which include things like books and housing and meals and tuition, but you apply the financial aid that's available to many students, it hovers around $20,000 a year at four-year public institutions and about $15,000 a year at two-year community colleges, which is obviously a lot of money, but when you factor in some of its living costs, it's a bit different of a picture. And cost of attendance has been relatively steady for several years now. The other piece of context here is that what the data suggests is most students who graduate will see a pretty good return on that level of investment. The data shows that nearly all students who attend and graduate from a public college or university or private nonprofit school recoup that net cost within the course of their career. But it's important that when we're talking about this, you know, speaking of graduation, that gets at something that maybe sometimes doesn't get enough focus in the cost equation. If we're talking about $20,000 a year for a four-year degree, but nationally only about four in 10 students are going to complete that degree within the four years that we traditionally assume a college degree is completed in, you know, many institutions have measured completion rates in six-year windows, eight-year windows, and there are methodological reasons for that. But the reality is that a pretty large chunk of students are either taking a lot longer and paying a lot more because they're doing this for more years, or they're failing to complete and leaving without any degree or credential value. And that's, I think, a lot of where the cost discussion really leads. Well, I think that's a good point that the value of a post-secondary education in terms of later earnings, and and I'm going to talk a little bit later in this podcast with Ethan from Jobs for the Future, and and he makes that point as well. Uh, I I guess I'm very surprised, maybe other people know this, but the notion that only four in 10 people graduate in four years 
is a surprise to me, and I can see where that completely skews the financial issue if you're, a, again, a parent or a grandparent, as I am both, and worrying about education for, uh, for your kids and grandkids. So given all that that you've just laid out, uh, how do most students pay for college in 2024? So as I mentioned in the discussion around cost of attendance, the majority of students receive financial aid, either from federal government, from a state scholarship or state program, or directly from the institution. Almost two-thirds of students receive some kind of grant or scholarship. There's about 5% of students who receive federal work-study funds. Those are obviously not funds that have to be paid back. Also, surveys show that the majority of college students, sometimes even as high as 80%, work at least part-time while enrolled, so they might be using some of that money to pay for their expenses. Obviously, beyond the realm of just scholarships and grants and working, there's a lot of attention around student loans, which are, of course, a significant source of funding for many students. We know a bit more than a third of undergraduate students will start borrowing and you know, by some metrics, overall undergraduate borrowing has declined a bit over the past decade or so. Some of the really high levels of borrowing are driven by graduate students. But of course, there are still significant concerns around student loan debt, particularly for low-income students, students of color, and especially, again, those students who don't complete a degree or credential. You know, after we talk about the scholarships and loans piece, we're really talking about the unmet share that students and families are responsible for. And I know we've talked on this podcast before about 529 accounts and college savings programs. We know that usage of those have increased by about 200% in the last decade. So it really it does depend heavily on individual circumstances. You know, there's some data around this that suggests on average, students and families pay out of pocket about half the cost of college. The overall takeaway is really that there is no concise definition of cost and how students pay because it varies so drastically based on situation, institution attended, time to graduate, and things like that. But it is fair to say that there's a growing trend, a trend that, you know, parents and families and individual students are paying a growing share compared to what they were expected to contribute a few decades ago. So, Andrew, you pay a lot of attention to what legislatures do in this area, of course. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what they're doing and how their approach has changed over time and what that means for students in their state. So, yeah, around the state funding conversation in fiscal year 23, states provided over $112 billion in total fiscal support to higher education. That's an increase over fiscal year 22. And states have increased fiscal support over the past decade after it notably declined during the Great Recession. Today, the situation we have today is that higher education is the third largest single budget area in state budgets. This is obviously a major budget priority for states. And how states provide that funding is really a diverse landscape, but I think it's fair to say it's basically through two streams here. There's the direct appropriations to institutions and higher ed coordinating commissions and the like in states. And then there's the financial aid programs that give money directly to students and families. That financial aid side of the ledger has increased a lot in the past decade. It's up by about a third. Many states have expanded their scholarship offerings and their financial aid programs. And in many states, somewhat generous need-based financial aid that supplements the federal Pell program. The direct appropriation side is the is much more significant, though, however, in the state spending context, because that's about 78, 80 percent of state funding is the direct appropriations to the institution. One of the biggest ways states can tailor their funding to meet their post-secondary goals and how states distribute that funding. There's a lot of nuance there. Most states have a relatively complicated approach to doing this. Some do it more simply than others, but many states don't even do it the same way they would appropriate to a four-year college as they do to a community college. So there's a lot of differences in structures of how these funding formulas work. Historically, most states have used, you know, a higher education funding formula that relied on how many students are attending an institution, creating a proxy measure through full-time enrollment or FTE and funding based on that. But over the past, you know, several years, a growing number of states have sought to include 
kinds of performance metrics to incentivize goals such as, you know, boosting completion or having a higher representation of underrepresented students. And so a majority of states have some element of performance funding built into how they appropriate higher education spending to date. While they have may have that in their model, though, the data suggests that most of the models use a small portion of, of the overall appropriation is allocated in that performance. So the national average is about 10% of higher education funding is allocated by performance. That's it. In some states, though, that's starting to change. We've seen states create newer, more targeted formulas that put more resources sort of in this performance lane of funding. So Texas, for example, last session passed a new formula for community college funding that includes metrics like successful dual enrollment, successful transfer to a four-year institution, and then, of course, degree and credential completion. Colorado has done work to modify its funding formula to increase funding for Pell-eligible students, underrepresented minority students, and first-gen college students. There's a lot of work in these Funding formulas really are moving targets. States modify them, amend them, and they're trying to, you know, reflect the workforce goals of their state and their higher ed goals as well. Beyond just the sort of funding formula component here is also that states are sort of experimenting with different kinds of programs like pay for success, which is, you know, Virginia Fast Forward is one of the most well-known models of this where students pay a third of the tuition costs when they register. The state pays a third once the training is completed, and then the state pays that last third once the actual credential is awarded. So New Jersey also has a pay it forward model to provide zero interest, no fee loans to participants who are working in high quality jobs. And I think with these programs, what you see especially is a connection to workforce needs. We see a lot of momentum around state financial aid programs targeting specific professions, specific workforce needs. South Carolina, Colorado, and uh, many other states have passed scholarships for specifically high-need occupations where they're experiencing shortages, things like nursing, education, construction. So there's a lot of energy overall on a lot of different fronts, on both the funding formulas front, the financial aid, and other type of programs that look for ways to reduce the costs, Split costs among, you know, not so, so there's not such a large burden on students and families and drive post secondary completion so that students leave with a degree or credential of value. Well, great. Well, great uh, for you for laying out that landscape because I think that's really important as we move on to our conversation with Ethan about some of those innovative financing approaches that you were just mentioning. Uh, Andrew, thanks so much. Take care. Thanks, Ed. Rely on state legislatures news on the NCSL website for the freshest takes on people, places, and policy. Find out what states are doing about the biggest issues of the day and check out the Across the Aisle and My District features for compelling stories of bipartisanship and special places and events. Make SLN your daily go-to for all the hottest legislative topics and trends. Just click on the News tab on the NCSL website, www.ncsl.org. Ethan, welcome to the podcast. Good to be here, Ed. Thanks for having me. So, Ethan, you're a senior director at Jobs for the Future, and I wondered, just to get started, if you could tell us a little bit about the organization, its mission, and, and your role there. Sure. So, Jobs for the Future is a national nonprofit. We focus on expanding economic opportunity, mostly through higher ed and workforce programs and designing career pathways. We leverage really deep partnerships with employers, investors, entrepreneurs, policymakers, education, and workforce development providers. We, as you can tell, we kind of we do a lot in this space, which is appropriate because there's a lot to be done. Now, I run the Financing the Future initiative at JFF. We launched this initiative in 2020 because we really saw there was this emergence of exciting and innovative new models to pay for education and training. We had a particular interest in models that could achieve really three objectives. You know, one, reducing the learner's costs and the risks. The second is really like aligning school incentives with learner outcomes. And the third is to, to really try to unlock government, employer, and private investment 
Well, I always find these conversations interesting because I'm of an age when higher education, post-secondary education, was not very expensive and was really pretty accessible to to a lot of people. And I, I think it's good to educate people about how those things have changed in the last few decades. I talked earlier on this uh, show with Andrew Smalley from NCSO about some strategies states are using to deal with college affordability or really post-secondary affordability to to be more precise. And I thought maybe you could take a minute to explain why these strategies are necessary in the first place and how the landscape has changed for students looking at post-secondary education in, in recent years. Definitely. And I think that's so important to like start off by kind of defining kind of this trend and defining kind of the problem we're trying to solve. I think oftentimes people like in, in my position can get really can get really kind of in love with certain solutions. And without first thinking about, okay, what, what are the specific problems we're trying to solve? So it's really important to set that out ahead of time. Uh, you know, so what we've seen is kind of a, you know, more and more that the cost of attending college or other types of post-secondary education is really falling on students themselves. And it was a function of two factors. You know, one is that over the last few decades, the cost of education has really been going up and up. Uh, and second is that the the federal government, state, and even employers have really been pulling back some of their own contributions to the cost of education. So like learners are now on the hook for about 45% of total post-secondary education in the U.S. This is more than double the average of other industrialized countries. Uh, this has led a lot of learners to now borrow more and more in federal student loans uh, to afford their education. So the average bachelor's uh, graduate leaving school with about $30,000 in loans and about one in four uh, borrowers are defaulting within 12 years of starting school. So already we can kind of identify this is a problem. While the average value of the education usually justifies those costs, for really for too many learners, especially those who don't complete their education, the education is unfortunately not leading to a well-paying career, leaving them and oftentimes their parents saddled with a lot of debt burdens that they can't pay off. Those of us who are not experts in this area certainly have read plenty of news stories about the student debt situation and the uh, rather enormous load of debt that's, uh, that millions of people are, are living with. And uh, certainly, I think that makes it clear to everybody that this is a problem that needs to be addressed. I wonder if you could walk us through some of these innovative finance strategies that, that states have considered. Yeah, certainly. So we define innovative finance, and I recognize that this is a term that is very kind of vague, ambiguous, and people may have heard innovative finance, and you know, that can mean a whole bunch of different things in different contexts. But for our context, you know, we define it as an array of emerging models uh, to financing post-secondary education that really represent new ways to spread the cost and the risk of education across a variety of stakeholder entities, including education providers, employers, government, community-based organizations, and even private investors. So I'll, I'll give you a few examples. Um, you know, one is outcomes-based financing. And you know, this is a finan financial instrument, uh, similar to a loan, but different in many respects. It's underwritten specifically based on the outcomes of an individual program or groups of programs. So these could include, you've probably heard of income share agreements, uh, or outcomes-based loans, or income-based repayment plans. Um, you know, all of these determine how much the learner is going to pay based off of the learner's own earnings. And then they make no payments if, the earning, if their earnings are too low. This group of outcomes-based financing, it also includes education insurance, which protects the learner against the risk of low income, and merit-based lending, which is structured as a traditional loan, but prices the loan on the basis of the program's outcomes. Another category is pay for success, uh, also known as kind of pay for performance or social impact bonds. Uh, but these are all partnerships that fund effective education and other social services through performance-based contracts. The learner doesn't pay anything, and instead the cost is distributed between the education provider and some other organizations, such as government or philanthropy, on the basis of the learner's outcomes. So the best way to explain this is maybe kind of an example. Massachusetts Pathway to Economic Advancement is a partnership between uh, the Jewish Vocational Service, uh, the state of Massachusetts, and JFF and social finance. They provide English language classes and integrated job search assistance. And the state pays, but they only pay if the participant is achieving positive outcomes. Oh, that's interesting. I'm a, a product of the uh, University of Massachusetts. The size of the educational structure in that state is so immense that it does sound like uh, that would be a, a good place to, to work on a lot of different experiments. How about employers? What's, what's their role in this? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So Lee, let me tell you about, first why it's important. You know, employers pay, play such an important role in the funding of post-secondary education. They generally have more resources than learners, and they also have more information about the skills that are important to acquire. You know, they're also the ultimate beneficiaries of an educated workforce, so it really makes sense that they contribute to some of that. Data actually suggests that employers are the largest source of workforce training, such as on-the-job training, continuous upskilling opportunities, tuition reimbursement. Yet employers may be hesitant to invest in their employees because they may be worried that once their employees are trained, the employees may leave for a competitor. And you know, the risk is obviously even larger for training a worker that isn't even their current employee. There is a variety of models that we have that can incentivize employer contributions. Um, you know, one is lifelong learning accounts. These are you know, structures that consolidate and leverage contributions from multiple sources and can be used by the learner to pay for education training. Another is employer training incentives. Uh, these use government incentives, either tax credits, deductions, or grants, to encourage employers to increase their education provided to workers. So, you know, one example is the California Employment Training Panel. It's a levy grant scheme that uses revenues from an employer tax to reimburse employers that invest in approved training. Finally, the Employer Connected Training Model. It's a training program, uh, such as you know, apprenticeships, I would say, fall into this category that combines job training with paid employment and usually involves the employer that is you know, working with the training provider to create kind of a customized career pathway there. So our audience, of course, is primarily legislators and legislative staff, other people concerned about state policy. And, and I wonder, what, what is the role for a state legislator or state legislatures uh, in this area? Yeah, so, you know, state legislators have a tough job. You know, there's many needs and worthy causes, but resources just aren't infinite. The innovative finance approach that, we, that we're studying, you, these can be really powerful tools that can expand access to high quality education and training to workers and learners across their state, but in a way that requires few government resources. So some of them may have a one-time cost, but then they can be self-sustaining over time. So for example, New Jersey, Indiana, and Connecticut have recently established pay it forward programs. Now, these are programs that are fully or partially sustainable revolving funds that offer affordable education financing. I think one of the most impactful things that state legislators can do is simply to reform their consumer credit regulations. So your know, existing consumer credit regulation is, is fairly ill-suited for income share agreements and outcomes-based loans. And you know, normally in regulatory policy, there's this trade-off between consumer protection, but also you want to give businesses space to innovate. But in this case, we're actually getting the worst of all worlds. Consumers aren't protected and innovation is unnecessarily stifled. And so I've been working to, uh, uh, in various states to update the regulatory guardrails. Uh, Colorado recently finalized a regulatory reform. California is in the process of doing so. They have a good rule. And then legislation uh, to, to update their regulatory uh, frameworks passed in the Illinois State House unanimously and, and await Senate consideration. You know, so rarely do legislators have kind of the opportunity to expand access to high quality education training without a budget cost. It's kind of a, a win, win, win here. Oh, that's very interesting. I don't think most of us would have thought of that as, as an area uh, where legislatures could act. These are all programs, it seems, to have a great upside for, for learners, but there's always risk to these things as well. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what kinds of concerns you folks have that if this isn't done correctly, it could be uh, a problem for some people. Yeah, definitely. So it, it depends on the model. Um, so you know, if you look at something like outcomes-based financing, <clears throat> you know, which includes both income share agreements and outcomes-based loans, but anytime you're talking about a financial product to consumers, there is a risk. There's a risk that the product may not be well designed. There may be a risk that the lender is, or the financer is predatory, that the student doesn't understand it. And that's particularly the case with these types of models. You know, they're relatively new. And so learner, and they're fairly complex too. And so learners may have a difficult time understanding the terms and how much they need to repay. You know, they may also have difficulty kind of comparing these options against each other or comparing them to the traditional loans that may also be available to them. And you can imagine a bad faith provider if they're, you know, if this is really kind of a bad actor, you know, could in theory design an outcomes-based financing instrument that overcharges learners or only gives the appearance of shifting the risk away from the learner, but actually doesn't do that. So it's, it's one of the reasons why we need really you know, clear, strong, and intentional regulatory guardrails. Overall, I'd just say that 
Innovative finance mo models, these are just tools, right? Tools are neutral and they can be used well or they can use, be used poorly. You know, a hammer is something that can be used to build a house, but hammers can also cause a lot of damage as well. So I think that it's important for us to see that there's a lot of real you know, upside, transformative upside to these tools if used wisely. But we also need to be, you know, be clear eyed about the fact that there are some risks. And the goal that we should have is how do we mitigate against the risks and capture that upside at the same time? Talk a little bit about the best way for states to work with the other partners in this area, whether those are federal agencies or employers. What kind of advice would you give to states? Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration. So one of the best examples, I think, is the New Jersey's Pay It Forward program. So this is a $15 million revolving uh, workforce fund. It upskills residents and fills critical job openings. And it was set up through a partnership between the state and the New Jersey CEO Council, which is a, a business group. Yeah, I think there's also an opportunity to leverage federal funds, especially workforce funds. Pay It Forward approach in particular, it offers the promise of stretching that limited funding uh, to serve more people. So I, I think that there's a lot of opportunities for kind of, again, you know, finding areas where there's a win-win-win here. There is some money that is, that is in the system. I think it's really a question of how do we leverage it? And if we can leverage it wisely by using these tools, I think that a variety of different stakeholder groups are, are going to be very happy about that and want to be a part of that. Well, Ethan, we've hit on uh, a few of the different innovative finance strategies, but this whole thing is a huge topic. And, and I wonder if there's, as we wrap up here, if there's anything else you'd like to point out, share with our listeners before we, uh, before we finish. One of the things that I try to hit on every time I do an interview like this is the importance of uh, state data infrastructure. I know it sounds so boring and so kind of tedious, but it is so, so important. And we've heard, you know, I, I know I've, I've listened to your podcast before, you know, kind of, and, and a lot of other podcasts in this area, how important, you know, the data infrastructure is for learners to be able to understand, you know, what, you know, the, the, the quality of the, the training that they may be doing. It's important for government to understand, right? So they're able to assess, do we want to be funding this program or not? Um, but in addition to that, you know, having a better labor market data infrastructure can also help these innovative finance tools. So, you know, many of them are you know, cumbersome. They lack accurate or relevant statistics. Um, they may not have standardized data. This makes it really difficult for innovative finance providers to accurately price their products because the student payments are contingent on income. And that income is going to be harder to predict if you have poor data. So if you have better labor market data that is connected to the um, you know, enrollment data from a variety of different programs. So you have a good sense of what the outcomes are going to be of those programs. You can be a lot more precise when you're underwriting some of these financial products, and therefore you're lowering your risk as a provider and also able to then offer more favorable terms to students. So you know, the, the issue of uh, data infrastructure is much larger than a lot of the innovative finance solutions that, that we work on at JFF, but it is just this is just kind of like now more than ever. You know, this is just one more reason why you know, state legislators should really, truly invest in creating comprehensive, standardized um, you know, state longitudinal data systems. Well, I have to say that in all the boy, more than 100 podcasts I've done on public policy topics, that is probably the one thing that always comes through is data, data, data. And if you don't have robust data, you're at sea because you really just don't know what you're doing. So great point. Ethan, thank you so much. This is a really important topic, and I know that we're going to visit it again. So take care. And it was a real pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I've been talking with Ethan Pollack from Jobs for the Future and Andrew Smalley of NCSL about new ways to help students pay for secondary education. Thanks for listening. You can check out all the podcasts from the National Conference of State Legislatures by searching for NCSL Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast, Our American States, dives into some of the most challenging public policy issues facing legislators. On Across the Aisle, host Kelly Griffin tells stories of bipartisanship. Also check out our special series, 
Building Democracy on the History of Legislatures. <laughs>